engineering and building science. He is a self-taught scholar in the methods and tools that were used by Europeans who settled in the Midwest from the 16 to the 1800s to build barns, churches, and public buildings that still stand today. His interest in history is mastered traditional tooling and techniques and decades of experience as a student and builder on multiple continents gives him a unique perspective that unites many disciplines. He writes and teaches and presents his insights and passion at workshops, museum conferences, and around the world. Thank you. You're welcome. So today I have, um, it's a two-part presentation. And because of what we do, I'm gonna talk a little bit about really kind of the nuts and bolts of, of the restoration work that we do. And, and ultimately what it really does is sort of lead to you know, how do you, how do you bid work and how do you plan for work? Because I, I think that, that one of the things that I, I run, that I hear a lot with restoring buildings is how do you, how do you, how do you budget for that? And, and I think the answer really is you, you really budget at it um, from experience and, and, and it really revolves around breaking these things down into um, parts and pieces. And our goal with restoration is, you know, my, my objective of being a business owner is not to, not to be a company that makes a living off of change orders. So we provide a bid and we execute the work based on that bid. And it's my belief that regardless of what we're doing, especially in this day and age with things like resistance drilling and the scanning things that we can, we're able to do that with our experience, there's just no way not to have, um, to be able to exceed people's expectations. But we, we believe that in order to do that, we have to have very, a very team oriented approach. And we use the work that we've done over the last 30 years, which really encompass thousands and thousands of restoration projects and the bulk of them um, relating to wood construction, although we've done quite a bit with historic masonry as well. And our focus is primarily um, structural timber too. But we also get into doing things like window and door restorations and, and stuff like that. So without um, taking that too much further, the first couple of slides that, that we talk about here, um, talk about how we do and why we do what we do. And, and I think that without understanding these things, it's really hard to understand um, how to build a good restoration project. And what, what I really noticed is that you know, the clients that we work with that um, know how to communicate and also know how to work respectfully with other people and when we, and the tr other trades that we work with um, really allow us to build holistic solutions. And also looking at everybody on the team as, um, as a stakeholder and somebody that's involved. And it, it's a little bit tough sometimes with the way some of the the, the, the bigger bidding processes work. Um, you know, the, the United States is a little bit different than the work that we do in Europe. And we're seeing a shift in the bidding process that's a lot more holistic oriented where um, it's not so much about low bidders, it's about finding qualified bidders. And, and so all of this works to develop a holistic solution to a building because, you know, unfortunately, a lot of the work that I've had to do over the years has to do with repairing work that was done by unqualified people because of um, bidding processes, for example. So the first thing we always wanna know is who's on our team. And I think, you know, internally in our own office, what we're trying to do is sort of figure out who's contacting us and, and where do they fit into the scheme of things? Uh, you know, who is the client? Um, you know, sometimes it's another craftsperson, sometimes it might be a contractor. Um, can be, um, you know, an executive director, can be a caretaker, administrator, but we're always trying to figure that out. And, you know, I think that depending on how things go, we have a variety of solutions and um, that are not solutions, but a variety of outcomes. And these, these photos on the left here, um, you know, are an example of a project that we got involved in and um, really got bogged down because of a lack of looking at it as a, at a holistic solution. And ultimately the building that we saved fell apart because they just got bogged down. Um, and they ended up hiring an unqualified contractor to do some work, which ultimately caused the building to fail. So they lost it. Um, and then considering 
you know, what everybody's capacity and collective experience is. You know, I, I work nationwide and around the world and I, and, and, I, and I work with a variety of people with a whole variety of skills. And, and that really also helps us, helps drive how we develop the project. And, and since we're often involved very early on in projects from a consulting or engineering standpoint, and even, um, you know, moving on to, you know, execution, which of course we do a lot of, really trying to understand what other people's capacity and experience are, um, help us to help us make a really good project. And so that's the case with clients who might be private, civic or government, developmental planners, um, anthropologists, archeologists, engineers, craftspeople, um, and again, caretakers and administrators. You know, even with um, projects that we often know very little about, what we're trying to understand are the parameters that affect our final plan. And the, the biggest parameters are the short and long-term goals. And what we're always trying to tease out of people is how long do you need this building to last? What kind of maintenance cycle do you want it to be in? And, and how often do you want to do those kinds of maintenances? And, and how is this building going to function in the community? Because when we do restoration work, um, even when we do new construction work, what we're really talking about are centuries. You know, I, we don't think in decades, we think in in centuries for sure. And so trying to understand how the building's role might change over time helps us develop a really good scope of work in restoration. And then other overarching effects besides the team's level of experience might be the politics in the community and you know, the relationship that the community has with the building. Um, quite often we're in situations where there is, a, there is a variety of opinions about how a building might be treated and, and whether or not the building has value. And we often play a big part in, in trying to obviously help convince people that, that build, these buildings are worth keeping. But pol politics and community often play a huge role in these things as I'm sure you all know. And, um, you know, as far as our objectives go when writing the scope, um, we're weighing the benefits of the types of repairs that we do as far as looking at long-term goals, um, what kind of tools and materials are available to the team. And depending on where we're working, they might be simple or sophisticated, meaning that um, it might have to do with a specific kind of tooling or a specific kind of repair. We want to understand the structure itself. We want to understand the aesthetics, the intent um, of the original builders, which I think that, you know, in doing restoration work, um, I think you have to be very capable of doing the same work um, in a new scenario. And I think that when that's part of the game, when what is happening is that you're not just re restoring something, but in fact, you could just duplicate that structure it really helps drive the restoration methodology. And you see it um, less maybe as a Band-Aid, but just simply, you're just fixing something that you, you know how to build anyway. And, you know, I think this ties in with traditional tooling. Um, you know, I felt it's very important for people to understand traditional tooling. And, and that really helps us get the kind of, um, you know, helps drive the expectation and, and the quality of the project. And then again, you know, sort of back to the future, we're looking for solutions that anticipate, you know, what the future will bring and, and what it might not bring, you know, and that might have to do with materials or um, overall design. How do we help that building survive something that we can't anticipate? Um, you know, one of the fundamental things, um, you know, when you start, when we start talking about things like UNESCO buildings and ICOMOS policy, um, you know, there's always this underlying principle that materials should be repaired with like materials and that techniques should be similar to, you know, the original techniques. And we follow that um, pretty doggedly, except when, it, except when we don't. And that's really when it just simply doesn't make sense. But by and large, um, there's generally not very, there are generally not very many reasons today why we can't use traditional or, or not, I don't want to use the word traditional, but why we wouldn't use materials or methods that were similar to the original structure. Um, and then, you know, as far as like 
these technologies go, meaning that, you know, we aren't buying lumber off of a shelf, um, for example, or we're not buying Simpson fasteners. There is the historic relevance, um, the cultural compatibility. Those two are probably the most important. And generally speaking, with historic structures, um, engineering benefits strongly from, tr from, these, from these methods as opposed to um, what we might call sort of conventional ones. Uh, ease, and ma ease of material procurement and um, the sustainability of these materials is also critical. Uh, the tooling, utilization of labor, and then something that I value quite a bit, which is the retention of knowledge. And, you know, I often talk about how it's important that people who do restoration work can also duplicate the building or know how to, or are even in the business of building buildings just like it. And that's what we're trying to teach people how to do. This is, um, this is something that I feel very strongly about. And then the enrichment of relationships and community because our buildings are about our communities and our buildings are about people being in them. And so we want people in them. We want to teach people how to fix them. All of these things, I think, um, you know, they don't sound like um, a bunch of financial uh, solutions to restoration but I think they are the underlying principles that we want to approach it by. And when we do, we have very successful projects. So what is, what is the right fit? You know, what is the right solution? And, and it starts with a series of things. You know, one thing might be to re review the method intent and the intent of the original builder, repairing in the like manner with similar material and adjusting for engineering performance. These are the things that we're, we're trying to figure out which glove fits on which hand. By and large, um, you'll find that I talk mostly about using traditional wood joinery, although there is absolutely a time and a place to move past that and, and really um, use some very, very um, slick modern techniques to reinforce buildings that would otherwise appear a bit Stone Age. Um, so here's just a set of drawings. And of course, with any project, any successful restoration, project it needs to start with a with a set of drawings and and now that we've been using a scanner for the past year or so um, it's really upped our ability to scan to create accurate drawings of buildings especially in in the amount of time that we need to so how does the building fit in its environment and and what were the intents what kind of joinery are we going to use um, how do we select species uh, you know as original material uh, valuable part of the restoration process or are there engineering values that need to be considered and you know by and large um, one thing we can say for sure uh, across the board is that all the roof systems in the midwest are underbuilt and buildings like this the octagonal and on up even four-sided big four-sided hips um, these facets are generally underbuilt and they're generally all sagging and so assessing what material to use and reinforcing these roof systems is really critical. How we look at wood, what we buy, um, you know, is it about ring count or grade? Do we need to consider things like heartwood and sapwood, um, envir environmental impacts of sourcing it? Um, you know, these are all things that I find in many projects are disregarded in bid specifications, but I think they're some of the most important things. We, talk, we need to talk about, um, you know, things like heartwood and sapwood, and we need to talk about, you know, what are the impacts of sourcing something? You know, there are, there are many restoration projects I've done where, you know, things like tidal cypress are specified for built-in gutter material. And, you know, it's just really not um, the right material anymore. Um, it's already, you know, for a whole variety of reasons. So um, these things need to be looked at in, in detail, and there are other solutions as well. Timing is important, often not considered, I think, in, in restoration, because in thinking about um, how we're sourcing materials, obviously, um, especially in the Midwest, you know, we don't want to source materials in April. We want to source materials in November if we're dealing with structural timber. And so taking these kind of things into account also really affect budget. So basic, basic wood joinery is, is kind of where we start and we, and we break these individual things down into parts and pieces. Um, our company lifts a lot of buildings and um, we do a lot of foundation repair work. 
a lot of sill repair work, um, but it is really just about breaking all this stuff down in, in its individual parts. And this, by the way, is a 85 foot clear span octagonal barn from 1890. Um, so as you can see, I, I personally am not a fan of using reclaimed material that is pulled from other structures unless it's sort of a, a resawn material. Um, you know, but by and large, what we are doing is approaching this from the standpoint of using new material where we do replacements and keeping the old fabric where it is. And, and part of this is budget. Um, I mean, certainly I've had a hundred times or so that, that somebody's dropped off a load of timbers and, and said, here, I'd like, I'd like to use these to fix my barn or my building. And they're full of mortise holes and all sorts of other things. And so resaw and reclaim material runs about seven to $9 a board foot. It can even be $13 a board foot. Simply just buying the same wood, um, in this case, white pine, you know, is a buck 75 to 250 a board foot. Um, and much easier to work with, much more predictable. Um, so at any rate, that's my, my spiel about new versus old. Not opposed to old wood, but um, it needs to be used in the right way. And here on the right, you can see um, in this particular building, like, like in a lot of buildings we do, um, um, the, you know, the next thing that's underbuilt typically in Midwestern buildings are floor systems. And so in order to get a building up to code, uh, for commercial gathering space, we have to get to hundred pounds a square foot. So quite often, um, old broken floor systems are taken out and new engineered floor systems are put in. This is the mixing of, um, old and new. This is how we modify our plan to do something, you know, affordable and still retain, uh, the structure itself. And just a little closing shot of this, this project um, has a new roof and a new floor and a new repaired foundation. I think um, hybrid methodology is also something that, <coughs> excuse me, um, we found to be really, really critical. This is an 1842 church um, that we're currently working on. We're about ready to put um, new trusses in this building, but last year we, we sliced um, sliced it open slightly and got inside and repaired these uh, 48 foot clear span uh, queen post trusses that had failed for a whole variety of reasons, partially because um, they'd been chopped up. So we, um, we uh, put double LVLs on both sides of this, sliced the hole in the side of this timber frame and, and reinforced these broken trusses. And now what we're actually doing in two weeks um, is we are replacing uh, three of these trusses in here where my cursor are. And so we're using the same timber framing method, the same size timber and, um, and simply replacing them in place. And what this does is it allows us to restore the building in a way that the original building was built without decapitating the structure and putting in something like steel trusses or modern trusses and it retains the historical integrity of the structure. And we can do all this cheaper than if somebody had come in and decapitated this building. So in order to do that, um, you know, we do, we do engineering. You can see in the middle photo where we sliced a hole in the soffit to slide in these 50 foot LVLs. So there was a first stage here that was reinforcing the roof so that it didn't collapse. And then a second phase where we basically surgically remove the center section of the building and put in new trusses. And more often than not, I see people give up on buildings at this point. And there's just, there's just no reason for it. Um, they're absolutely, absolutely repairable and absolutely repairable, cheaper than building a new one or doing other things like, you know, decapitating the roof system. So when we talk about, um, you know, how to do something like that from a restoration standpoint, um, you know, we do a pretty, pretty solid survey. We do some pretty solid drawings. We run engineering numbers. And then again, we just break this down into parts and pieces. This, uh, this next case study here is a, is a large barn move uh, we did in Pennsylvania, a big four bay barn. And again, you know, a conversion to a assembly space. And so a lot of pretty heavy duty engineering, the structure's and six feet long and 66 feet wide. 
Um, many of the timbers in the building are 66 feet long. And, um, and so again, you know, back to this, uh, this floor system problem, um, you know, generally speaking, most floor systems are underbuilt. Um, a lot of horizontal members in frames are underbuilt. And there's some pretty slick ways to reinforce those. This is the keyed beam approach that allows you to um, utilize the existing girt in this case. And then this is, this is actually resawn, reclaimed uh, material that's keyed in with the girt above it to get the, the loading capacity up on these timbers. And of course, you know, doing a hand raising with volunteers saves a little bit of money, which is what's, what's going on here. This is a six, uh, 50, 53 foot wide bent, um, weighs about uh, 9,000 pounds and has about 50 people um, pulling it up. I think the, the biggest thing with restoration and, and, and not having cost overruns is to adequately plan. And, and so here you can see that in this particular project, we took the time to do, um, and, and generally we take the time in, in a lot of cases, to do a model. And so this, um, this screen that's running here on the left is the order in which that frame will be re-erected. Re and there are other things that you can do with these things like predicting what size cranes, you know, where you're gonna place cranes and um, you know, where you're gonna place people and, and how you're gonna go through the method statement to do the work. But um, really the point being, uh, really the key to the success of restoration is a, is a high level of planning. And it's really, nothing, nothing happens by accident in restoration work. Just a couple completed photos. So that barn got moved about, um, it was about 15 miles and it's about 90 feet from the ground to the top of the cupola. So it's, it's a big one. Um, and inadequate modern repairs, uh, more often than not, um, you know, the structures that we're working on have not been repaired or repaired well or properly since they were built. This is a typical Burr Arch um, truss bridge, the most, you know, one of the most common types of trusses for bridges. This is 167 foot clear span in Missouri. And, you know, three or four restoration attempts were, were undermade were made, undertaken. And in all cases, um, just um, not the right approach. Um, the, the, the folks that were doing it, um, in one case, probably caused more damage uh, than they did good. So, you know, really coming back to it and, and, and coming back to the original approach. And in, in this particular case, it was just putting the camber back in the building. And I think we needed to put about 16 inches of camber back in this bridge to make it work. But, um, but, a, but a lot of what we are doing often is just fixing, um, fixing old mistakes or bad repairs. But these, uh, this bridge you know, had actually sagged about a foot and um, quite a bit of discussion about whether or not it should just be let go. But really, you know, it just needed to be lifted up and tuned it is really all it needed. Here you can see us doing, and, and to tune a bridge, um, you generally do it with these uh, horizontal members here. Um, so you, you know, you essentially over time, you get some decay or you get um, some compression and some um, just overall sagging in the bridge cords. And by reestablishing the lower cord, it defines the length um, at the abutment um, and making it rigid defines the camber. So the real tune up on a bridge uh, in this scenario is just this lower cord member. another photo of that bridge. And, um, you know, masonry buildings have suffered um, and, 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 and in large part, as, as you all know, to Portland Concrete and um, aggressively trying to uh, stucco over soft brick and things like that. And so, um, you know, the, the expense and the repair um, really on many of these projects is in undoing uh, what was done in the last 50 years. And so for the case of this building, all these lower areas for the most part had been redone with Portland concrete, which of course bonded to the brick. And it, in all cases, it would have been better if they just would have done nothing. Um, the original, uh, most of the original stuccos up here on the upper walls, but 
you know, coming back with a lime putty mortar and a soft brick. Um, unfortunately, in the U.S., it's really difficult to find um, affordable soft brick. So now what we're doing is purchasing it from England at about half the price of buying soft brick in the States. And, um, and generally too, with lime putty mortar, um, we can buy from overseas cheaper than the US. This project was also done with Keim, which is a German uh, stucco um, that uh, works well with soft mortars and soft brick. But in, in order to make this, this project work, um, it all became about using um, basically the same methods and materials as what was used before. So here on the right, you can see the concrete just pulling the wall apart, pulling the brick apart. And, and almost down to um, the last course of brick on the inside of the building. If that concrete had never been put on there, it just never would have um, gone that far. So some pallets of soft brick there um, on the right. And uh, in this project, just um, completely restuccoed on the whole, the whole lower level and ground out all the joints. This is the steeple building in Bishop Hill. And, it, and it's been holding up very, very well. Um, but it hadn't had anything done to it except being damaged by the people that were trying to take care of it, um, re really probably starting in the 19, 19 teens or 1920s. We do a fair bit of emergency repair. This is uh, one of the McDonough County barns that are so famous and I've shown it before, but it's, it's, it's again, the kind of thing where, um, you know, people get really freaked out because the buildings leaned over three feet and all the posts are broken and, and, um, and it's just irreplaceable. You know, when I start to talk about these structures with folks and explain that, you know, a 39 by 39 foot two story building like this is going to cost me about $350,000 to build, they start to look at estimate, estimated costs of, um, you know, 80 to $100,000 to repair it and get another you know, 150 years out of it as, as something that's, that's reasonable. This is a drop siting. Uh, we ran this profile um, in new doors, basically kind of a whole newer, new lower level. But the, you know, it takes about three or four days to lift up a building like this and straighten it and about a week to put a foundation in another three or four days to set it down. And then the rest of it's pretty straightforward floor installation and, and siding installation. A beautiful roof system though, as you can see. It, a lot of our work is, is phased and I think that find, we find that to be you know, very affordable. This is a project that we've been working on on and off since 2008 that started down in the basement and ultimately um, ended up working out, working its all, way all the way to the top, um, finally to a, a new roof, um, a window restoration and some structural repair. And then most recently working on the height at the head house at the top, but phasing it, um, intelligently phasing it um, is very doable. And, the, and early on in projects like this, we really try to talk about um, you know, what makes sense as far as phasing something over a long period of time, like a decade or more. And then, you know, the, the, and how much historic fabric are we gonna retain? This particular project is um, in, in Kansas in the Tallgrass National Prairie, but very focused on, um, you know, retaining historic, fa historic fabric and how do we do that um, so that we can meet code and, and public safety requirements. And, and in this case, um, you know, rather than do a lot of floor replacement, um, it really just became a lot of beveling of the floor in some areas so that we met that, for example, quarter inch requirement for um, ADA, which you can see here. This, had, this particular floor had um, five or six different elevations of changes of about an inch, but the National Park Service was very interested in retaining the original material and, and how that pattern told a story. So um, we came up with a fairly simple way to do that by creating aprons everywhere that would meet code. 
this uh, this project, of course, you guys might know, this is the Iowa City Capitol building that burned um, when they were doing paint removal with uh, a torch, uh, which um, generally isn't a great idea. So we were involved in the reconstruction of, of this steeple and and, I, and, and part of why we show this one is actually how a system doesn't work. Um, you know, a lot of very discordant people. And in this particular case, really hiring the wrong engineering firm um, and, and having some people on the team who, who apparently just, you know, in many of these scenarios, just don't have the background or the skill to do what they're doing. And so costs just go completely out of control. Instead of having a good team of qualified people, sometimes, unfortunately, we work on teams that just absolutely is the wrong crowd and, and come from the wrong background. But ultimately, um, you know, it got put back together, but not without a $14 million lawsuit, I think, um, 10 years ago when the paint all flaked off of the new building that we, the new steeple that we put up on top of there. And then we talk a lot about, you know, on-site versus prefabrication and, you know, church steeples are one place where sometimes we do, um, you know, we, we clearly do a lot of prefabrication because of the distances and the heights involved. And so generally speaking, we find that doing restoration work by pre-cutting things oftentimes makes a lot of sense. So just some common repair scenarios and how we look at them, you know, as I said, a lot of my work is revolved, revolves around timber framing. And so um, just starting with some basic concepts of, of you know, names of things like queen posts and tie beams, girts and knee braces, um, getting the language right is often the first thing that we need to do. Language is so important um, in this business. And, and when looking at structures like this, um, you know, how, do we break, how do we break these down into the parts and pieces of a repair and turn them into buildings that look like this start starts with um, you know coming up with joinery solutions and so here's one this is um, this is sort of a half free tenon and one thing to understand about tenons in general is that in order for a peg hole to work you need four peg diameters after the hole and so another common issue with, um, with timber frames is that there's joinery failure. And so we need to repair tenons. And this is a pretty uh, affordable way, fast way to do that. And it, it, it's not too difficult to estimate because you can see in a building before you take it down that there's likely tenon failure. Scarf jointing is, um, is also a, a good way to you know, retain historic fabric. It's a, very, um, it's a very easy number to quantify. It's, it's six hours to cut a scarf joint like that one there. Um, free tenons uh, in the middle photo. That's a free tenon for a, um, a tenon that failed due to uplift in a wind situation, which isn't too uncommon. If queen posts on a building are fastened down well, um, the next thing to break would be the, the, post to tie, the post to tie beam connection in this orientation. And then the bottom right photo is a common uh, method that we use for spline repair. Um, where a girt or something like that has been cut out of a building. And keyed beams um, as a way to reinforce existing stuff. So these keys can be cut into a building while it's standing and you can reinforce the um, load capacity of the timber by simply adding another one along with these keys. And so it's, uh, it's like, as you can see in the upper right photo, Another common problem with all our buildings is um, underside, our undersized purlin plates. So the upper right photo is an up undersized purlin plate. It had another one added to the bottom of it. And then a variety of other, um, you know, sort of free tenon scenarios. The middle photo is a, is a wedged dovetail. So there's a slope cut into the bottom of the post and that tenon is inserted and then the, um, the wedge is driven in. And it doesn't always have to be solid wood. It could be micro lamb or LVL as a free tenon, or which is what this is, or it can be solid wood on the right. Um, we also do a fair bit of testing, which is what the photo on the left is showing, is showing what tech peg failure and tenon failure look like. Um, that's about, takes about 10,000 pounds, 11,000 pounds of tension to do what happened in that particular connection. But um, 
post to tie beam failure and tenon failure is really are really common things. So these are very affordable solutions to deal with that problem. Um, rotten rafter plates that are just a small chunk of the building. Um, this is a 24 foot uh, rafter plate. And so obviously no need to replace the entire plate. So we scarf joint in a small section. This is off also a very, very easy item to budget for. Um, and if you, um, if you need to, you can do a little exploration and, and see how far along the plate you need to go. But most of the time it's fairly obvious. Sill plate to post connections are another common failure problem. So the photo on the left is the corner post of the building and the photo on the right shows um, some new posts with a new sill and, um, and some old posts also with a new sill and some braces. So it's not uncommon to just assume or plan for an entire sill replacement. Or if it's not the entire post, um, the bladed and cog scarf joint is the go-to scarf joint for vertical connections. And so you can see two in this building, one in the foreground and one in the background. The under squinted stop blade wedge scarf is the go-to scarf joint for eave connections. It's a really, really strong connection for tension. Uh, the bladed cog scarf is used a lot for post um, deflection, but um, as a tension joint, this is what we're looking for, especially in church steeples as well. But again, um, just replacing a section of rafter plate with something like this. And this, this is a bladed cog uh, scarf that has a key. And so that's what's happening right here. Again, um, being able to replace a post uh, that's rotten without having to dig into the entire building. I mean, I can't stress that enough, like how important that is to be able to consider that you're replacing a force in the building without potentially getting into the rafter plate or even into the whole structure. Uh, I showed this slide yesterday, but post to tie beam connections. Um, so you've got a situation here where a rafter plate went bad. And um, so we needed a post, but also both tie beams of both ends of the tie beam on the swing beam uh, rotted off. So we've got uh, scarfing in some new pieces. Exterior girts and floor joists, um, again, same sort of scenario, um, just budgeting for being able to replace those individual pieces. And then, you know, finally, you know, I've said quite often that in order to do this kind of restoration work, it's really important to be able to do it um, as, you know, building new as well. I mean, the, the skills to build new um, make the restoration work seem much easier, but, you know, being able to understand exactly, you know, everybody involved understanding, you know, how timbers are loaded, how buildings are loaded up, um, being involved in some of the timber testing and things like that really, really give everybody, you know, in the whole group an insight into um, just what is possible. And especially for the carpenters doing the work, so this is a testing rig that we did a couple of years ago that show how racking affects joinery, for example. Um, so I think that that also really helps from the standpoint of, you know, how do we look at these structures and repair them and have some sense of not knowing that, you know, knowing that we're not overbuilding them.